Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, we are going to get started. It is right on time. So welcome to the NAGT webinar. The webinar series is your one-stop shop for strengthening work in earth education. Webinars in the series feature novel and innovative work in earth education, research, and pedagogy, new teaching materials, and the classroom and ex professional experience of people just like you. The NAGT webinar series is free and open to the public, and we encourage you to invite your colleagues to attend and join the discussion. On the screen is a link to the webinar series where you can find the webinar schedule and archive of past events and information on our sponsoring projects and programs. You can find slides, resources, and recordings of each webinar, including today's through the webinar archives. And these links are also in the chat. Before we get started, please take a moment to review the Zoom controls on the screen. We ask that you leave your microphones muted and your cameras off. If you have questions and comments along the way, we encourage you to enter those into the chat box. Webinar presenters and staff will be monitoring the chat throughout the presentation. As a reminder, all, pre all participants of the in, in wait, all participants in um, NAGT meetings and events are expected to abide by the NAGT code of conduct, which applies in all venues, events, and online forums associated with NAGT. Please read the full NAGT code of conduct policy, which is linked in the chat for details. Today's webinar is titled Shake Alert, Educational Resources for Teaching About Earthquakes and Earthly Early Warning in the U.S., presented by Daniel Suing and Robert Michael Group from USGS Shake Alert. They are going to introduce ShakeAlert Earthquake Early Warning System for the West Coast of the United States and discuss any of it or all their available resources. Thank you both so much for participating in the NAGT webinar series. You can go ahead and take it away. Danielle, I think you're muted. Oh, great, thank you. Let me just take a minute to share my screen. I'm trying to follow Bradley's directions. <laughs> um, so, let me get this started. Sorry, it's going to take me a second. Okay, Bradley, it looks good. Yep, you're good. Hey, great. Thank you. So hi, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Um, my name is Daniel Sumi. I'm the National Educational Resources Development Coordinator for ShakeAlert. On behalf of me and my co-presenter, Bob DeGroot, who is the ShakeAlert Coordinator for Communication, Education, Outreach, and Technical Engagement. It's our pleasure today to present our work on behalf of the ShakeAlert Joint Committee for Communication, Education, and Outreach, and specifically for the Educational Resources Working Group. We wholeheartedly believe that even the most scientifically and technologically advanced earthquake early warning system would fail without the proper education, training, and communication with the public and various stakeholders. So ShakeAlert Earthquake Early Warning is made possible through partnerships between the U.S. Geological Survey with over 60 universities, geophysical networks, nonprofit foundations, and state and federal government agencies. The USGS manages the ShakeAlert Earthquake Early Warning System, which is a product of the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program, or NEHRP, and specifically the Advanced National Seismic System, which is under NEHRP, and that is the abbreviation um, ANSS that you see in the bottom right. I work for IRIS, the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology, who operates and manages the National Science Foundation's SAGE facility, and SAGE stands for the Seismological Advancement for Geosciences. Bob works for the U.S. Geological Survey, and my work is made possible through an intergovernmental personnel agreement between IRIS and the USGS. The partners outlined in the black box are those who contribute to the Educational Resources Working Group, and I'll talk more about these partnerships later. So I'd like to begin, because this is going to be very interactive, I'd like to begin the talk with a question. How many of us pre-COVID, when we used to fly and travel to conferences and actually see each other face-to-face -face instead of over Zoom calls, would read or listen to safety instructions provided either by a flight attendant, a video, or reading the information in the seat back pocket. So um, Bradley showed the, the controls, but please raise your hand if you can answer yes to the following statement. I read or listen to flight safety instructions. 
So I'm just showing on my slide too, also how you would raise your hand. And I see a bunch of people are raising their hands, which is actually really wonderful. <laughs> so, okay. I see a lot of people actually do this. So you guys like aren't like me, which is really great. Um, a lot of you do read those instructions, um, but I, you know, I typically would gloss over that part of the flight because I thought, you know, what's the point? How frequently do plane crashes happen? Certainly not every day. So it's not likely to happen to me. And if a plane crash were to happen, well, I'd surely not make it. So it's a completely fatalistic type of mentality that I would have. I don't do this anymore, I promise you. Um, but if you are like me and you didn't read or pay attention to the safety materials, you know, thank you. But furthermore, for the people who do, the Federal Aviation Administration found that comprehension levels of this material can be as actually as low as 18%. And so just images and, and these sorts of things may not be as easily understood compared to multiple modalities. And that's, that's a really good analogy for earthquake preparedness and our challenges. So the Earthquake Country Alliance has prepared materials like the seven, seven steps to earthquake safety as shown on the left. And Shake Alert has put together graphics around drop, cover, and hold on with an earthquake early warning perspective. And this is shown on the right. So instead of like, if you just feel shaking, drop, cover, and hold on, it's if you feel shaking or get an alert, drop, cover, and hold on. So however, the creation of materials is not is simply not enough. We need to overcome the outreach hurdle of making sure that these materials get into the hands of the people who need them, which is everyone. But we also need to make sure that we offer multiple modalities of education resources. People need to see a video, hear a recording, have closed captioning, and have materials in multiple languages. And this is because we want people to feel emboldened to take ownership over earthquake preparedness and that they know what to do in the event of an earthquake. However, we do get some pushback. You know, well, if an earthquake were to happen, I wouldn't make it anyways. I'd be a goner and toast. Um, but there are ways to learn more about what to do in an earthquake, how to be prepared and how to survive and recover. So here, I just wanted to provide just a basic outline of our talk today. This was available on the website where you registered, so I'm not gonna go through it, but in this talk, I wanna let you know that we'll primarily introduce the five W's, the who, what, when, where, why of ShakeAlert. So how does ShakeAlert work? This is an animation that we created to focus on the main questions of what is ShakeAlert and how does it work? That's the first thing we always want to convey to our audiences. ShakeAlert is a new tool in the earthquake preparedness toolbox. The ShakeAlert system works to quickly and automatically identify and characterize an earthquake after it begins. It is not earthquake prediction. And that in fact is the first misconception that we have to address. ShakeAlert also works to quickly calculate the magnitude or a size of the earthquake and the intensity of expected ground shaking. And magnitude and intensity are not the same thing. And this is the second misconception that we try to address. And third, we want to deliver warnings to people and systems that may experience damaging shaking. And we'll talk a bit more about this throughout the talk. In short, animations like this one, where you can see what's happening and listen to the narration, not just me talking over it, help to make the concept of shake alert earthquake early warning come alive. And so this is our first poll. So shake alert earthquake early warning is operational in which states? California, Oregon, and Washington, Alaska, and Hawaii, Oklahoma, and Texas, or Missouri and Tennessee? Well, looks like we've, we're for California, Oregon, and Washington, which is correct. And I see that a couple of people voted for Alaska and Hawaii, and that would be great. In fact, the more materials that we're producing, we're starting to incorporate that in two educators who live in Alaska and Hawaii, though currently um, there is no particular plan right now to move to those states. So, okay. All right, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Bob. 
Hi everyone, I'm Bob DeGroote and uh, thanks again for joining us today. I'd like to echo Danielle's sentiments about uh, spending some time with us today. Uh, I've been with the USGS, actually it'll be five years on May 1st and uh, had been working uh, exclusively with ShakeAlert before USGS. I was with the Southern California Earthquake Center for about 17 years. And I, I would like to say, and I know there's a little bit of bias <clears throat> associated with this statement that uh, I think that, uh, that ShakeAlert is, is unique among the USGS programs. And, and actually, uh, even though it's biased, it's actually true. Um, this system, and I think Danielle already alluded to this, is that it requires people to interact with the system directly. And of course, as we will get across, there's this whole idea that, that seconds uh, matter. And so we'll, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, also, what's really unique about this project is that it, it requires a, a, a extensive relationship with industry, with, with organizations that are willing to take USGS Shakler data and, and use it for a variety of applications, and we'll touch on that. And so this slide, I just, I just really want to kind of get a, a little bit of a point across here about, about why why did we choose California, Oregon, and Washington? Clearly, that was the result from the survey. People uh, got that point, which is great. And uh, really, the idea here is, is that most of the earthquake risk is, is in the three West Coast states. And I think you can see that from the numbers. And as, as Danielle mentioned, uh, we, we are committed, the USGS is committed to completing the system in California, Oregon, and Washington first and then we'll consider expansion to other states. And I know there's been a few comments here and there, especially from the previous USGS director about expansion to places like Alaska and Nevada. But uh, like I said, we wanna finish off what we started first. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, for one thing, just to know a few notes about this is Shakler has been, been operational for what I will refer to as automated actions, automated systems since 2018. And what's happening this year, which is actually pretty cool, is we are expanding the testing of alerting to mobile devices to Oregon and Washington. Uh, California went this path back in late 2019 and is, is now moving into this direction. Uh, in uh, the, the rest of the states are moving in this direction this spring. And so you've probably heard a little bit about what's happening in Oregon back on the 11th of March and then in Washington on the 4th of May of this year. And the one thing that I think that, and we can't under, undersell this at all, but and Danielle and all of our colleagues that work with us in the communication, education, outreach and technical engagement side of things, we are ultimately going to serve more than 55 million people on the West Coast. That includes residents and visitors. And so uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to this uh, a little bit later about some of the other impacts. And one thing that we try to do is characterize ShakeAlert as a, a, a new tool in the Earthquake Preparedness Toolkit. And what we wanna do, and I think a lot of what we, a lot of the resources that we're, we're developing and we're also leveraging, and Danielle showed the seven steps earlier, is that we're really trying to integrate ShakeAlert with existing earthquake preparedness and education efforts again, just to, to, to continue to enhance what's already happening. Let's go ahead to the next slide, please. So a question for you, next uh, 15 or 20 seconds, go ahead in the chat box. What do you think an earthquake on the West Coast might, how it might impact folks on the West Coast? And I think there's been some things going on in the news recently, like something that happened in the Suez Canal, maybe, um, maybe even COVID has sensitized us to this, but what do you think that what an earthquake on the West Coast might do for the rest of the country? Yeah, see some really good, really good ideas coming through here. And yeah, so, so y'all see the, the, the wonderful ideas. I think you all have the ideas with this about what, what, what the impacts could be, everything from materials that arrive on the West Coast, say Port of Los Angeles, Port of Long Beach, and some of those items get onto trains and are transported all the way across the country and then are put on another boat and transported to Europe. So it's, it's not just the, the US, but also potentially impacts on the world, which is a, is a pretty interesting piece. So I, th I think that, that th this is another thing is I, I, I visited, I spent some time in Montana 
uh, giving some talks to hospital associations. And we talked a lot about, well, what will happen if there is a, a, a big earthquake on the West Coast? You'll have the migration of people going East. And so people will, will, um, will go to places like Montana or Idaho or Nevada or Utah to, to basically find safety and find shelter. So I think this is, uh, I think we've gotten some great answers here. I think, I, I hope you agree, Danielle, we've gotten some great answers. Yeah, yeah, all this is yeah. really great. Exactly. Cool. Let's go ahead to the next slide. And so, you know, this, 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 this advanced, advanced organizer, excuse me, uh, diagram that we have here of, of ShakeAlert kind of tells the story of, of what, what ShakeAlert is. Uh, this is something that's, that, that we make available to our partners to use. And again, I'm not gonna go through the entire diagram. It sort of spells out the basic uh, process of ShakeAlert. But the one thing I just really wanna get across, and I think I've already expressed this point is that ShakeAlert is a massive effort and it has many moving parts. Um, we have support coming from across the, the federal government, our states, and also private funding. And really, this is, this is really the goal here is to, to build this public earthquake early warning system. And we really rely very heavily, and what I'll spend some time doing is distinguishing between what the USGS does and what our partners do. But we rely on over 60 alert delivery partners who we're working with to develop interesting, novel, useful ways to get the data that's produced by the USGS, what we call a shake alert message, and use that information to deliver, to produce and deliver an alert or to set into motion an automated action. So um, I think, um, let's go ahead and go ahead to the next slide. And I think that we will, yeah. So a question here for folks, and I, I know this isn't a chat box, well, it could be a chat box question, but um, just to get a sense of what, what, where do you think, or how do you think ShakeAlert differentiates, differentiate, differentiates itself from the rest of the products that are shown here? So this is actually, a, there are a lot of initialisms and some acronyms and things like that, but you see ShakeAlert sort of position right there in this, in this diagram. How does ShakeAlert differentiate itself from other, these other products. And by the way, all these products are um, products from the advanced national seismic system, things like ShakeMap and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. How does it differentiate itself, do you think? And I think the, the key point here, uh, just to really get across is that um, Shakler is very different because, well, for most, for most cases, most of these products are post-earthquake products, mm -hmm. things that are are provided after the event happens. ShakeAlert is something that happens or something that's produced, ShakeAlert data is produced while the earthquake is actually occurring. And that's a really important piece. And the, the example or the analogy that I use is there was a, a very famous engineer at MIT, his name was Harold Edgerton. And he was very famous for these ultra fast cameras that um, took pictures of devices or processes happening that were really fast, like bullets going through balloons or milk drops hitting a surface or machinery and that move very quickly. And so think of ShakeAlert as an ultra fast camera taking pictures of the earthquake basically as it's happening and providing that information, uh, making that information available so that alerts can be delivered and potentially alerts reaching people before shaking arrives at their location. So that's a that's a, a piece of this. So, um, and one of the other major pieces of this as well is that of course ShakeAlert is one of the many um, advanced national seismic system tools and products. So, let's go ahead to the next slide, Danielle. So, um, this is a, a flow chart that we 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 use to basically show what ShakeAlert does and and how it works and to really differentiate what the USGS does and doesn't do. And I'd like to point you to the, the two arrows, not the ones at the bottom, but kind of just the ones just above the bottom. Uh, it says USGS Shake Alert System and then Delivery Partners. And I think it's really important, and I think I've already touched on this point before, is that what does the USGS do versus what do the delivery partners do? Well, of course, the USGS and its partners maintain sensor networks, seismometers across the West Coast and there are three seismic networks that we, we work with. And we're currently about 70% built out across the West Coast. There's still some work that needs to be done in Oregon and Washington and Northern California. You can see that from the diagram on the right. 
uh, on, on this image. And um, basically what we do from there is we, um, we move information. So basically Shakler picks up ground motion and moves that information really quickly from the field. In fact, that's been part of the work that we've been doing is upgrading the telemetry systems in these sensors to move that information to one of three processing centers. And you can see on the diagram, there are those, those red triangles that uh, one in Southern California, actually in Pasadena, another one in Menlo Park in the Bay Area, and then the third up in Seattle. And we move that information from, uh, from, from basically from the field to do some processing. And basically what happens here is that um, the information from the field is processed and the Shakler system makes a, um, makes a decision whether or not to, to issue what's called a shake alert message. If that shake alert message, the decision is yes, we're going to deliver it, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're, gonna make it, we're gonna make it available, then what we do is we make it available for delivery. And I guess the, the basic analogy here is, is almost this, this standpoint of, of like mailing a letter. Uh, the USGS writes the letter basically and puts it in an envelope and then we put it into the mailbox and then we make it available for people to pick up. And basically what this, what happens here is that we have, a, again, 60 or so partners who are working with us, who have attached to our servers, who are picking up these shake alert messages. They use that information and then they, um, they, they deliver the alerts. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, let's go ahead to the next slide, please. So question is, um, how much warning warning time do we expect for earthquakes? Mm -hmm. Interesting results. Mm -hmm. Very. Okay. So, so just to just to talk a little bit about this is that uh, really um, one thing that I think that's really important to stress, and I probably didn't stress it enough during the last slide, is that ShakeAlert is completely automated. So, from field detection to moving information from the field to the processing centers to the issuing of ShakeAlert messages, it's all done automatically. And then we make those ShakeAlert messages available to the partners that then um, develop and deliver alerts. And we want as much of this to, is to be automated as possible. And part of those alert deliveries could be to people through cell phones and those sorts of devices. So um, one of the things that we, and, and there was actually a recent uh, open file report published by the USGS about potential alerting times in the Pacific Northwest. And, um, and I, I don't know if Danielle, if you wanna be put that into the, into the chat box or not, if you have already. But uh, the idea is that um, we, um, our expectation based on all of the things that we've looked at is 10 seconds or less seems to be the, um, seems to be the, the, the warning time that we're expecting, but you can do a lot in 10 seconds. And in fact, many of the operations that ShakeAlert is going to be doing will be done without even you, any humans being involved at all. And so those things will happen very, very quickly. Everything from opening firehouse doors, to um, uh, shutting off water supplies, it, a whole number of different things can happen. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead to the next slide, please. So we, we've been talking a lot about these shake alert delivery partners, and this is just a partial list. And the, the list on the left are a group of folks that are what are called our licensed operators. And they're actually in the business now of, of helping build this earthquake early warning industry. And that's really one of the major goals of ShakeAlert is to encourage uh, the, the, the development and the implementation of an early warning industry. And we're working in, in approximately 12 different sectors, including communication and healthcare and education and uh, utilities, a whole bunch of different areas. To, to be able to find ways to use ShakeAlert. And we're really just on the verge of really expanding all of this. And of course, in working with all of these people and all of these groups, we're interested again, as I said in the beginning, is the interface between what these folks are developing and people. And so we're working very closely with these folks to really emphasize a really solid education and training. Um, now we have the basic information. If you get an alert on your phone, 
or on some other device, um, it'll give you some information. So we have a message that shows up on, on phones now that says something in the order of earthquake detected, drop cover, hold on, protect yourself. And that's something that will get people to identify what it is and what the action is and they do it. Um, some of these situations that folks are working in um, may be a lot more sophisticated. So we're working with these people to really identify those areas that um, make sense. If you're working in a wet lab or you're working in a large industrial facility or whatever, um, we are really going to these folks to help us best understand uh, the sorts of training that needs to be done. So um, the other piece that I think is critical as well is that one of our one of our main talking points, one of our main issues that we like to share is that we want people to get alerts on their phone, through PA systems, through other devices. We want people to get alerts through as many pathways as possible because it's this whole idea that having that extra backup is critical um, because some systems may not deliver the alert at all and others may deliver several alerts. So we wanna make sure that folks are covered. So that's something that we're very, very concerned about. So with these technical partners, um, we really want to we judge them, we, we rate them uh, on two main areas, how well their systems work, the technical side, and the other piece is how well they've developed their education and training. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I talked about systems getting alerts, but there are ways that people can get alerts. And uh, there are several ways that we have um, been working, working with uh, different organizations in the, in, on the alert, alert delivery side for people to, to cell phones and, and to other devices. Um, the one on the left is wireless emergency alerts. It's the system that's managed by, the, by FEMA, um, getting alerts to the integrated public alert and warning system or IPAWS. Um, if you get Amber Alerts, this is basically the same system. Um, we're, we're also working with Google and Google is delivering alerts directly through their operating system for, for Android devices. And then third, we have several purpose-built apps that have been developed by partners. And um, uh, in the, a variety are operating in different places in, in California. We have all three. Uh, in Oregon, there's a variety of groups that are, that are delivering alerts to devices. So. Let's go ahead to the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Well, Bob, I think one thing we wanted to mention is that there are these wireless emergency alert demos and that... Um... Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks for mentioning that and thanks for reminding me about that, Danielle. And, and, and one of the things, of course, is that we're always trying to improve the shake alert system. And so Danielle mentioned that we did three, three tests or, well, two tests and a demo, depending on how you want to categorize things, mm -hmm. to really get a sense of how quickly alerts are getting from the from the, from shake alert to uh, to to the actual device where the alerts are being delivered, and so we did three tests: one in Oakland, uh, one in San Diego County, and then a third, actually just uh, last month, in Washington. Three counties in Washington. Um, one thing to be really clear about is that WIA was not in wireless emergency alerts. That system was not developed for shake alert speeds. It it it. it and this is why we're, we're working with these partners to figure out ways to move information as quickly as possible. If you think of the basic currency of ShakeAlert is time. And every step of the way in that diagram, that flow diagram that I showed earlier, every step of the way there is, there is, there is, there's, that takes time. It, there, there are latencies associated with each step. And so the whole idea is that we're trying to figure out ways to shrink those latencies at every step of the way. So the effort here and Danielle and, and, and other team members are involved as, as, as authors on a paper about WIA and how we can improve that system. So let's go ahead to the... Yeah, Bob, there's actually some interesting questions in the chat that I want to take a second to say. Sure, thank so you. So there was, a, there was a question about which apps we recommend. And so we, we don't recommend a specific app over another app, um, you know, whichever one that you, you personally prefer and, you know, is fine by you. Um, and then there was some questions about what, what about people without phones? And I wanted to make mention that, you know, we, ha we hope to have, you know, and there are some folks who run it over like FM radio and PA systems. And there are other ways to get um, alerts that um, aren't these just everyone or many, not everyone, but many are connected to their phones these days. And that is a, that is a source 
that we can receive alerts. And then um, there was a question about what about for people or sectors that are not connected to the internet. And I just wanted to say that wireless emergency alerts, again, are like Amber Alerts and do not run over Wi-Fi. Um, so um, yeah, so it, it is actually through a cell phone provider um, that those alerts would come through for. And, um, and then there has been some questions about just the comment of like 10 seconds or less. And the, and the discussion has been that, yes, it absolutely depends on your location away from the uh, initiation of rupture in an earthquake, but we don't want people to rely on there being more time so we would prefer people to be accustomed to 10 seconds or less of warning and not think that they'll have longer time. Yeah. I, yeah. So Bob, let me know if you want to expound upon any of that. But, no, um, no, that's, that's all great. Okay. And I think it covered <laughs> okay. a, lot of, a lot of those, those points really well. And I think that's, that's part of it is that, you know, what we're finding is, is that a lot of times when people report um, alert, potential alert times, that people have, warning times that people have, oftentimes those numbers are reported as how long it takes for the shake alert system to publish the shake alert message for that data mm -hmm. to be available. The issue we're dealing with is that we have to add on to that all of the delivery times associated with moving that information from the shake alert servers to wherever it's going. And so we're still making lots of, of advances, especially working with, this, with the wireless providers to move that information from, from basically where it sits to people's handsets. And so, yes, we, we are taking a very uh, conservative perspective in just making sure that people understand that they're likely in, in, in the best case, in, in the vast majority of cases, 10 seconds or less is what people should plan for. Um, and taking that protective action uh, as quickly as possible is something that's critical. And we're trying to sort of retrain people. Danielle was talking about training in, 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 in airlines and in developing this, this procedural knowledge of getting people to, to do things without thinking. We want them to react similarly to when they get an alert to when they feel shaking. So we're adding on to step five of the seven steps essentially. Uh, so that's a, that's a piece there. And I think we should maybe go to the next slide. Um, this is just a picture. One thing we did, and, and Danielle was one of the one of the planners for this, with also with some colleagues from the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry and the state of Washington, is we did a basically an interactive activity with folks in the three counties in Washington uh, for the WIA demonstration back on February 25th. And people looked on their phones to see when things were delivered. So let's go ahead to the next slide, please. And the last piece is user actions. And I think that um, really, uh, and I may be amplifying on something that Danielle said earlier, is that the ShakeAlert system is meant for you. Um, we want to make ShakeAlert accessible to all. So we are taking very, very seriously and spending a lot of time on those with access and functional needs and other, other challenges that people face in using the ShakeAlert system, be it accessibility because of technology or other things. And we're spending a lot of time on this. In fact, one of the biggest pieces of our operation is our social science uh, enterprise, which we're working on over 15 different projects, everything from shake alert in schools to a, a messaging that people get after, after alerts are delivered, say if it's a false alert or something along those lines, we're working in a whole bunch of different areas to, to figure these things out. And one of the things about, about shake alert in particular is that um, I talked about latencies. I talked about every step of the way it takes time. And one of our goals is to reduce the human latency that when a pe person gets an alert on their phone, we want them to take that protective action as, as quickly as possible. So um, we really want to optimize human behavior, much like the card that was in the, in the seat back of, of, a, of a plane. We want people to do things as quickly as possible and without really spending a lot of time thinking about it. Finally, I just, I just want to mention that, that, and I know we have a poll for the next question. I'm going to turn it back to, to Daniel after that. But ShakeAlert really is, if you want to use an example in the classroom, it's one of the best examples of STEAM that's out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, adding on the, the A to STEM, um, there's really, this, every piece matters. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we really think that the, the social science piece is really going to contribute to this because it will, it will really help us understand how human beings, how people interact with this complex technological system. 
So let's go ahead to the to the poll. So um, go ahead and take an answer to this and I'm gonna turn it back over to Danielle. Yes, so most people are, um, while people are filling out the poll, um, but there was some questions about the magnitude or intensity cutoffs for um, the different, the various um, apps and devices. And, and my, my answer in the chat was that it depends. It depends on what app or device that you're using. But there are um, different magnitude and intensity cutoffs. It just it sort of depends on your sensitivity and what you want to be alerted for. Um, but Bob, do you want to say anything more about that? Yeah, I, I, we, we, have a, we have a table on shakeout.org that, that lists the, the different thresholds, but I'll just give one example. For, for WIA, for wireless emergency alerts, those alerts are, are really meant for imminent, imminent danger. And so basically what we've done is that the, the threshold there has been set at um, that our, we, we set delivery up for earthquakes that are magnitude five and larger. Mm -hmm. And alerts will only go to people who could, could potentially experience uh, damaging shaking. So basically uh, for WIA, um, alerts will be delivered at magnitude five and higher to those who could feel um, Mercalli intensity four or larger. And that's mm -hmm. how it's set up. And then the other applications have different thresholds, but um, they're calibrated uh, just depending on, on where the needs are and, and also the performance of those particular uh, approaches. Great, thanks. Oh, thanks okay, Daniel. yeah, all right. So what can you do with seconds of warning? And Shake Alert aims to, wow, okay. Um, I can't get the poll to not be on my screen. I guess Bradley, can you close the poll? Cause it keeps popping up, okay. Let me go back a slide and restart. Okay, so what can you do with seconds of warning? Shigler aims for the public to be able to take protective actions such as drop, cover, and hold on, and automated actions that can be put into effect like shutting off gas valves and protecting water supplies. And drop, cover, and hold on is the recommended protective action by the USGS and the three shake alert states if you feel shaking or receive a shake alert powered earthquake early warning alert. And these animations, this one and the one that we saw uh, at the beginning of the talk, um, are, were both developed off of our What is Shake Alert animation made in early 2020 to provide examples of how Shake Alert works and how Shake Alert protects people and things. So Bob has mentioned this quite a bit, but there are five main working groups and five main priority areas. And the main focus that I wanna to bring to your attention is priority number five, which is this educational resources development and dissemination. I'm the team lead for the Educational Resources Working Group or ERWIG. And I want to just take a brief moment to highlight the team. I work cl very closely with Shelley Olds of UNAVCO, Jenny Crane of OMSI, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, with Megan Anderson of the Washington Geological Survey, and with Cindy Pridmore at the California Geological Survey. And we sort of form the core ERWIG team that is focused on Shelley's doing curriculum development, um, OMSI is working on outreach, and Megan and Cindy um, work with us um, to help uh, propagate these resources out there and do a lot of outreach in their communities. So uh, as Bob has mentioned, we work in strong collaboration with the other working groups. And I want to note that social science is a part of all five priorities. And I'm working closely with one of the co-chairs of the social sciences working group, Dr. Sarah McBride of the USGS on a lot of these um, WIA messaging and WIA tests um, and doing the analyses of it. Um, all social science projects address the critical needs for shake alert operations. And I wanted to really, really mention that special consideration is given to address the needs of diverse communities. We want everyone to know about shake alert and know how to use it. So we're looking specifically at DEI work in relationship to shake alert. Um, those who may have limited literacy, limited English proficiency, disabilities, and access and functional needs. Shake Alert is committed to serving all end users. And I wanna say everyone of every age too. And I'll highlight one of our resources, Rocket Rules uh, in a few slides. Hey Danielle, before you go on, we had two questions related to drop cover okay. and hold on. I thought maybe it would okay. be timely to hit those. One okay. is um, 
if you're outside is mm -hmm. drop cover and hold on still, uh, should it be done or not? And the other mm -hmm. is in Washington, um, uh, people, or I suppose Oregon and uh, Northern California as well, could also shortly get a tsunami warning as well and, um, and how the messaging is to, to make that less confusing. I, yeah. Uh, sorry, Danielle, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to say that like if you're outside or if you're in a car, you should definitely try to get over and get away from anything that could fall on you. Um, with these unreinforced masonry buildings, like if you're walking on the side, bricks could fall off the side of the buildings and hit you. Um, so I think it just depends on where you're at outside. The, the main thing is to just make sure that you're in a safe place and drop cover and hold on. Um, you know, if, if you're in a location. Um, a lot of, when earthquake shaking happens, it's just hard to move. And so a lot of injuries occur when people try to move uh, against, you know, the earthquake shaking that's happening. And, and, and so that's why we really encourage that whole drop piece. Um, and um, with the tsunamis, we suggest that after earthquake shaking stops that you do get to high ground. So a lot of our animations at the end of them do come with this preparedness message of drop, cover, and hold on. And then when shaking stops to be, get to high ground if you're in a coastal location. So Bob, yeah. is there anything else that, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's great. And, and I just wanted to mention uh, that I put in the chat box a link to step five for from the seven steps to earthquake safety. and. Uh, the, so drop cover and hold on is used as a placeholder for uh, for a lot of these for a lot of these protective actions, and so it's summarized there, and it tells you what you need to do if you're in a theater or if you're driving or if you're in the middle of a field. So um, we use the drop cover and hold on message as that sort of catch all uh, for all situations. Mm -hmm. And with regard to tsunami, uh, Danielle's right. Uh, we do put messaging in there. We're coordinating with the three states with tsunami messaging. Of course, there's also ongoing coordination with our partners who are involved from the Department of Commerce in a, a tsunami tsunami uh, related warnings and alerts. So. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Okay. So the animations and videos that we've produced, um, you know, just show an example of the educational resources that we've developed. And we also have the overarching goal of making educational resources understandable to a wide range of people, groups, and identities. Again, that close work with the social sciences group. We wanna cover not just the formal classroom that you see in image A or on the left, um, but we want to cover a full range of learning environments. And that could be like a museum, like the middle image from OMSI. Um, it could be anything really like talking to a neighbor about Shiglert, um, could be an informal learning environment. Um, so we have a partnership with OMSI um, in Portland, Oregon to help with the development and assessment of our educational materials. And that work is just beginning. The first pilot project we're working on is for the What is Shiglert animation. Um, and we're also starting to build partnerships and connections with OMSI to other communities in the um, three Shakelart states that might be in, you know, public libraries, national parks, booths, um, like what you see on the right image at conferences, um, just any place that you would go to learn more, we want you to have Shakelart resources. Um, Thus, our resources have to be adaptable for a range of educational environments because it's not just a one size fits all. Um, because museums and other free choice learning environments are trusted sources of information in our communities, we do want to build these strong partnerships. And this is something that we are, um, OMSI has been with us a year now, and so we can, we are continuing that work. Um, but kind of back to the point of like, we have many modes of engagement that we want to, to do to complement the communication of how ShakeAlert is this critical new tool for earthquake risk reduction. And as we learned from you know, airline safety, these multiple modalities like reading, participating in activities, viewing a video or animation may help to solidify learning. And so I talked a lot about animations, I've shown you examples, but the next step I wanna show you is uh, some of our activities and how we've developed these. Um, we held a series of listening sessions with stakeholders in emergency management, healthcare, education, transportation and utility sectors. And what we identified was that there were many of the same concerns and misconceptions. And so our WIG, the Educational Resources Working Group, we wanna help develop these resources to address these questions. And we do this you know, by coming from a place of learner-based inquiry. We start with a range of questions that you see these did you know kind of hook questions. 
Um, and we aim to use the best practices in education to develop activities. And we really th want them to be time dependent. So if you have five minutes, if you're at a conference booth or you're at a state science teacher association workshop, you have five minutes to hook somebody in. Maybe you talk about how rocks are elastic. You use a rubber band and you show how rocks are elastic. Um, or if you have 15 minutes, you know, like if you have a cart in an informal learning institution like a museum, you may be able to talk about how an earthquake has one magnitude, but many intensities and why that matters for Shakelar. We often find in our work that people know the answers, but then these questions really help them to think more broadly about the topic, um, specifically in the Pacific Northwest, and people have hit on this with their questions. We find that everyone is very, very focused on the magnitude nine Cascadia earthquake, the big one, but we often forget about the more common intraplate earthquakes like the 2001 Nisqually event or other more localized crustal events that people are more likely to get alerts for compared to the magnitude nine earthquake. So that does present uh, an outreach challenge for us. So in the chat box, a completely self-serving chat question is, you know, what are some earthquake related misconceptions that your learners have? So I'm gonna open up the chat box and see what people comment. That there's earthquake weather. Yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. That magnitude is intensity. Yeah, that's very common. Right. So I see a lot of those similar ones that they can't happen in the Midwest. Yeah, we've been talking a lot with our partners at QSEC, the Central US um, Earthquake Consortium, about that. Yeah, that the San Andreas Fault is the only location that can have big quakes to get into a doorway. The reason you don't get into doorway is doorways have doors that are also shaking and could hit you and knock you out. Yeah, so a lot of these, like how what you do in the event of an earthquake is a problem, but the ground opens up and swallows animals all. Yeah, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of misconceptions. California will fall into the ocean. Yeah, so um, lots of, lots of really good ones. So we are driven to correct these misconceptions. And we have developed six different modules for ShakeAlert that are available at iris.edu slash ShakeAlert. You can see that in the top right hand corner. We have focused on uh, earthquake hazards. The fact that earthquakes do occur in the West Coast. For California, that seems pretty normal, but for the Pacific Northwest, they haven't had a major you know, earthquake in, in some time. Um, they have you know, threes and fours here and there, magnitude three and fours, but you know, they haven't really had a major earthquake. So just letting people know that, yes, you live in earthquake country is a big misconception that we we try to come across and, or try to overcome. And we wanna, want people to learn more about the faults and plate tectonics in their region. The second one we do is earthquake basics to combat the misconception that earthquake early warning is earthquake prediction. When in fact, it's the quick detection of the P wave and then to send out an alert before damaging S waves or surface waves arrive. So that's another misconception that we try to combat. Um, that big difference between magnitude and intensity, I'll go through that in just a minute. Um, some of the resources that we've developed. Um, alerts are primarily sent out based on intensity, which will obviously depend on your location um, compared to the earthquake. So that's a big misconception. We also wanted to talk about tsunamis and other related hazards. So we have liquefaction and volcano and tsunami related material um, so that people who live in Shake Alert states are aware that you know, they're susceptible to a full range of geologic phenomena. Um, the fifth one we are working on currently, so it's the only one that's coming soon, the rest of the resources are available, <laughs> is earth mitigation and planning to learn how to prepare before, during, and after an earthquake. And we want to try to put together a focus group of emergency management professionals in the three shake alert states to help us develop that. And finally, we have resources on earthquake early warning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop um, and this show. Um, sorry, I'm trying to um, be fancy. So you should now be at Bob, let me know. Can you see the Shake Alert um, page on IRS? Yeah, it's it's sort of focused in on on. It's not the whole page, but it's just part of it. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. I'll it's scroll good. down a bit. 
Okay. Yeah. I'll just keep scrolling. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Figuring out Zoom. All right. So we, again, are focused on education and training materials for formal and informal learning settings. We do have a blurb about why everyone should care. You know, over 143 million people live in earthquake prone regions in the U.S., you know, uh, Washington, Oregon, and California face one third of that risk. And so that's why we have focus there. If you just go on our first, um, you can see that this heads straight to the animation that I've shown you pieces of. This animation is four minutes and 35 minutes, 35 seconds. And so I only showed you pieces of it, um, which I'll show you where you can access those below. We also give a level, a novice, um, intermediate, advanced, or expert. So a lot of our resources are based for novice level. And just by clicking on the word Spanish, it will take you to the Spanish animation. Um, so I won't go there just for the sake of time, but you'll see a blurb about the animation and that it has closed captioning. And we also try to develop key points or learning objectives for each one of our animations or activities. Also, we give you everything. You can download the resource and plug it into your own talks. We don't hold on to anything. Um, if you wanna use it, please go ahead. Um, we also even give you the full narration. If you just wanna take bits and pieces from the narration, do it. Um, we have uh, GIFs um, related to the late alert zone and different concepts that we're trying to portray. And one really great impact has been that local media, as we are rolling out Shake Alert Earthquake Early Warning to uh, mobile devices in both Oregon and Washington this spring, um, media has picked up these GIFs and are using them in their local news reports. Um, if you're curious, you can scroll all the way down. There's lots of GIFs. These were the expert excerpts that I showed today during the talk, how to shake alert work and that earthquake early warning protects. So that's all I'll talk about for the animation related to that. And here are the six modules I've mentioned. One resource I wanna make sure that you're aware of is under earthquake early warning that we have developed this rocket rules activity and coloring book with the Hero and You Foundation. Um, I'll quickly briefly go to that resource. So you can just go to that page we send everybody, even if you're an external partner, we wanna send you to that material. And so this Rockets Earthquake Safety Activity Book is for our preschoolers. And I have a three-year-old and my daughter loves to color. Who doesn't love to color? And so I love that preschoolers could potentially pick up this material and then take it home. And their, their grown up is then, you know, doing the activities with them. And it's been, like 10 languages or something. And there's also animations and other materials that are available with Rocket. We also, I'm gonna scroll down through all of the different languages, but there's also Shake Alert specific activities that you can do for it that's aimed to K through five uh, students. And it's both in English and Spanish, these Shake Alert related pages. So I will close out of Rocket really quickly and head back. And then the last thing I want to just show you briefly is an example of one of our activities under faults and plate tectonics. You can go to this introduction to faults and plate tectonics. What I love is it's embedded, so you don't have to really download anything. You can just look at it. But we do try to make sure that they are apt for beginner, that they have these times. And we, we really try to lead you to all of the materials um, so it has materials and instruction and relevant media resources. And so it's pretty much all inclusive here. Um, I won't walk you through all of it, but I did want to give you just a sense of what we've been working on. And again, all of these activities follow the five, 15 and 30 minute type timeframes and start with these, did you know hook questions to engage your learner from the start. I also wanted to let you know, cause I won't scroll all the way through it. If you're like me, sometimes I kind of get motion sick doing that. But at the very end of all of our activities, it also has the next generation science standards so that you're aware of um, what resources, what our resources are really aiming for. Um, the last piece that I'll show you, again, just navigating through our website, is the resources on magnitude and intensity. And if you go just straight to our intensity, we had an eight and a half minute long animation that we split up in five different modules. The first module is an introduction that talks about how magnitude and intensity can be like a light bulb. A light bulb has a specific wattage. It's a 50 watt or 100 watt light bulb. 
but the intensity of light varies depending on how close or how far you are away from the light bulb. So the wattage of the light bulb, its magnitude never changes, but the intensity does. And then each of the modules walks through the four geologic factors that relate to intensity, magnitude, distance, depth, and rock and soil conditions. Lastly, I wanted to mention we developed this new animation. It's kind of long, six and a half minutes, but it's how construction or buildings affect the intensity or the shaking that you may feel. And we worked with two structural and civil engineers who were expert reviewers of this material. And um, we really feel like this is a strong resource that you can present engineering concepts to your learners. So with that, I will head back to the presentation that I think I've now lost my place. Um, but... I will just wrap up to say that our resources have been getting a lot of attention from the public through local news media and social media. When Washington held its wireless emergency alert demonstration in February, our shake alert animation was uh, picked up by Como News, which is a local ABC affiliate in the Seattle region leading up to that demo. And then um, in advance of Oregon Shake Alert rollout, we did an animation specifically that earthquake early warning is coming to the Pacific Northwest. And we talked about how, um, because the rollout date was March 11th to coincide with the 10th anniversary of the Japan earthquake, we talked a lot about how the Pacific Northwest is very much related um, in its tectonics to Japan and that we can, um, in the Pacific Northwest, we could also experience that type of earthquake. This animation was also picked up by local news sources like the Fox affiliate in, in Oregon. And what's been really great is they've been just taking our animations and sort of using them, you know, point blank. And then the open file report that Bob mentioned, the uh, expected warning times for shake alert is going to be the resource for our next animation that we're currently working on. So just to conclude, um, May 4th, May the 4th be with you, is when um, Washington rollout of public alerting to mobile devices is going to happen. Um, late July of 2021 is when we're planning to have a uh, wireless emergency alert demonstration in Oregon. We have four activities that are ready and available and three more are on its way very shortly. Um, animations are receiving a lot of really great attention. Um, we are working on evaluation with OMSI and the University of Colorado Boulder with Lori Peak and the Natural Hazards Group there to do evaluation of the What is Shakler animation. Otherwise, we've been doing a lot of outreach and trying to work with as many diverse groups as possible. We're always looking for new ideas and collaboration. So that said, here are our contact information. Please follow ShakeAlert on at USGS underscore ShakeAlert on Twitter. My personal handle is at Dr. underscore Earthquake. Um, so please feel, feel free to get in touch. And so um, with that, Beth, Bradley, I don't know, here were some discussion questions that we could talk about or we could just wrap up. Let us know. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has any last minute questions. It looks like we have a couple of minutes if there are things that you guys want to ask. Someone could even unmute and, and ask a question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, one question that Bob and I have is, yeah, how would you plan to bring these modules to your learners? Could you use them in your classroom? Um, you know, where could you see using them in your day to day? It looks like there's a question about if you yeah. guys encountered any problems. Yeah, thanks Sammy for that question. I saw, so I'm, I guess I'm just trying to understand if you could maybe um, explain what you're asking um, in terms of issues with, with people wanting to evacuate or I guess I'm unclear on the question. Maybe Danielle, maybe you can 
Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that I'm thinking of is just like, one of the really, I think, curious things, at least from my perspective is, is that this has very dramatic behavioral implications for when people receive an alert, you actually want them to do something. You want them to not just have the knowledge base and know about earthquakes, but you really want to create that behavioral change with, you know, drop, cover, and hold on. And so not only we have to kind of have some behavioral knowledge of like, if you receive an alert or, you know, experience shaking, what to do. Um, and, and so that's been a huge part of our social science and what we've been doing to really make sure that those messages are communicated properly so that when they receive like earthquake detected, you know, drop cover and hold on, that people do that. And, and so the social sciences group is really working hard on not just the creation of the alerts for people to be able to then take that protective action, but then what to do after the earthquake is over, shaking has stopped. So the post messaging alert piece as well. Mm -hmm. um, the evacuation piece is also challenging um, to just make sure that people you know, know that because of the building styles that we have in California, Oregon, and Washington, we working closely with um, specifically Amanda Syok and um, Forest Lanning um, from FEMA to make sure that we are taking a comprehensive approach when we are, you know, say drop, cover, and hold on, that it's not just a social science thing, but that it's a structural engineering piece. Um, I worked with Sarah McBride, again, one of the co-chairs of the social sciences working group, on a paper that as a trained seismologist was a little like stomach churning because like a lot of death um, reports from how people die in earthquakes. Like there are immunologists and um, even epidemiologists who study these sorts of things um, to look at how people are injured and are impacted through looking at coroner's reports and different things. So it's a little yeah. stomach churning. Yeah. But, you know, that's why we have really seen that drop, cover, and hold on is the best for the three shake alert states. Um, but it is not a one size fits all for other countries. Um, and I really want to make that point clear. For other countries that have different building codes and practices, you know, that, that may not be the best thing to do. So um, also, I was just going to say that the Pacific Northwest is very transitory. So people who may experience Nisqually 20 years ago are not the same people who live there now. Yeah. Um, and so we need to constantly thinking that not, not only about the residents who live there, but also about people who may simply be visiting the Pacific Northwest or California. How do we let them know about Shake Alert and that they may, that they live, they are now visiting earthquake country. So a lot of these are really interesting challenges. So, so one of the comments I made earlier was about Shake Alert being one of the best examples of steam out there. And, and what Danielle, I think, is really getting at, and many of the things she's getting at have to do with the fact that we're combining many different disciplines to really get at this, this, this problem, not only in the technological side of making a better earthquake early warning system, the, the part, the, the guts that actually detect the earthquake and make the decisions to, 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 make, to make that data available, but also on the delivery side. And with regard to protective actions, this has been a question that's come up for many years. Great, the great checkout earthquake drills have been happening since 2008. Um, there's been a lot of work in this area. Um, one thing that we're doing to better understand what people do during earthquakes is we've gotten our hands on a lot of uh, closed circuit television data to study what people actually do from earthquakes in Anchorage, Puerto Rico, um, and also in Ridgecrest to, to get a sense of what people do and how can we optimize protective actions. And with regard to what people do and, and all of this, this is an active area of research. Um, and in fact, we have some papers coming out soon. There's a whole bunch of different things that we're doing to better understand uh, the protective action questions and, and what people should be doing. So um, this, is, this is the incredible part about Shake Alert. And I think Danielle has, has really expressed her enthusiasm for this is that it's such an active area in so many ways that we've, we're really making a lot of strides to better understand how to better teach people about earthquakes and associated areas, but also um, improving uh, safety, improving, uh, uh, basically reducing earthquake risk, protecting people better. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I'm just looking in the chat about like outreach to visitor centers or outreach to theme parks and resorts. And yeah, I mean, this is something that we're actively trying to engage and do the research um, to make sure that we're not just producing materials that they might not be able to use. We don't wanna just become like the producer of things that they may not be able to use in their particular environment. So we're really starting to develop um, a strategic plan with OMSI, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, to figure out how to really do this effectively. We're also starting to chat with those who have been doing this you know, longer than us. Um, what I didn't mention was that Mariah Jenkins, who's a student contractor uh, with the USGS, she and I are working together to look at all the range of free choice learning environments that have earthquake related materials. And then what we're starting to do is reach out to those exhibitors and say like, have you thought about earthquake preparedness in your museum exhibit? Have you thought about how you might incorporate earthquake early warning into your mu museum exhibit, um, things like that. So we're just kind of beginning those conversations. Um, we had a great one yesterday um, with someone from the Cascades Volcano Observatory who does volcano outreach. I mean, we wanna learn from people, you know, and, and so, um, and we also wanna learn from our international partners as well who have earthquake early warning. Um, you know, what could we be learning from Mexico that they are doing with their communities? those sorts of things that so we're not just generating materials, but that we're actually learning from, um, you know, tour, we're reading a lot of papers and things and trying to learn from the tourism industry of how to really get the word out there and trying to do our homework. And one thing we know, of course, is that, and I know that Beth, uh, Beth has talked about this quite a bit too, is that, you know, the more people hear about these things, hear about how to protect themselves and what to do, from multiple environments over a long period of time really gets that 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 idea into people's heads of what they should be doing. So, and, and just seeing, well, how does it apply to me? And that's a pretty important piece. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it looks like we are over time actually. So thank you guys so much for yeah. a great presentation. Um, and thank you everyone so much for coming. Um, 